Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Epic Comic Book Wednesday. This is a world's finest collaboration between Michael K. Vaughn and myself, where we combine the forces of Stately Vaughn Manor and Hyde Cottage to talk about the comic books on which we've wasted our youths. <laughs> and since I horned in on this whole thing years ago when Mike was doing just an ordinary comic book feature on his own channel, he gets to pick what we talk about. This has been smooth sailing suspiciously smooth saying I now see in retrospect uh, for the last few Epic Comic Book Wednesdays uh, because Mike and I don't always agree <laughs> on, on comics and on comic book characters. He's a big fan of Marvel comics with all of its loser heroes <laughs> as a gigantic wall of Marvel Epic collections. Uh, today's pick will be rockier than some more recent ones. It won't be as bad as it could be. Not nearly as bad as it could be, but bad enough. But there is a silver lining, because it allows the return of a topic that has been missing from Epic Comic Book Wednesday for several weeks now, and that is the Stan Lee virus. <laughs> because we are talking about a book today, a seven or eight issue run on a loser Marvel comic book, that is one of the epitomes, one of the high points, or low points, depending on how you look at it, of the Stan Lee virus. And that is Demon in a Bottle. Iron Man, written by David Michelini with uh, assist by Bob Layton and artwork by a young and extremely up-and-coming John Romita Jr., the son of the canonical Spider-Man artist, John Romita Sr. Uh, this thing came out at, right at the end of the 70s. It's uh, uh, Right at the end of the 80s. It came out... Uh, it, uh, it came out just as a decade was falling apart. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, perhaps before we dig into this issue, these issues, uh, you might be wondering, what is the Stan Lee virus? Those of you who've blocked it out through trauma or who are new to my channel. The Stan Lee virus is something that Stan Lee invented in the early 1960s when he revitalized superhero comic books, when he came out with Fantastic Four number one. And then a whole roster of other comic book creations. Perhaps one of the most successful, sustained feats of creativity in the history of America. Uh, he came out in the course of two or three years. He came out with a series of names that your children know. That your grandparents know. That are part of culture. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and he had a new idea. Two new ideas for these superhero comic books. He grew up, of course, on real superhero comic books, the same ones that I did. Uh, but he had an idea for what superhero, how to change that world of superhero comic books. One was continuity. If something happens to a character, they should remember it the next time you see them. And so should everyone that, around them. So, and so should everyone else. And the other is a shared world, verisimil verisimilitude. That if one of his characters is dealing with an earth-shattering event in Lower Manhattan, all the other characters that live in Lower Manhattan will probably know about it and realistically be involved unless there's a reason not to involve them. Unless you would be, ex it would be expected that you as the creator would give a reason why they aren't involved. Unlike, for instance, in real comic books where if Wonder Woman is facing, Wonder Woman could be facing the legions and legions of otherworldly warriors commanded by the Greek god of war invading Earth. Invading Washington. Platoons of, of ogres in the streets of Washington. She has to come up with a way to deal with that. She has to come up with a way to defeat that. And in the next issue you're not going to get... No one's going to. She's not going to remember that that ever happened. She's not going to refer to it. Neither is anyone else. And in that issue when she's coming up with a way to deal with that it's not like Batman's going to show up and help. He's, he's not. And the same thing in his book, where he has all kinds of trouble, but the, no one else intervenes to help him. Uh, unless they happen to live in Gotham City, and even then. I mean, in a couple of, of old comic books uh, from the pre-Stan Lee days, Batman and Robin will be driving down the streets of, of Gotham City in the broad daylight, of course, in their Batmobile. And they'll just happen to run across Green Arrow, driving in his Arrowmobile with his teenage sidekick. Uh, but it wasn't a matter of course. It was, they were insulated. Every creative world was insulated. Stan Lee decided to get rid of both of those things. Wanted to, anyway. Worked really hard to do so. He, he wanted his characters to seem real, like real people, in the real world outside your window, despite the fact that they have superpowers. 
and he wanted there to be continuity. He wanted the, the, the world of every one comic to make sense in the context of every other comic. Those two things combined to form the Stan Lee virus, and in my opinion, it ruined comic books. <laughs> because once you introduce continuity and verisimilitude, you have nowhere to go. There are no options anymore. You have to keep upping the ante. There's no way around that. You have to keep upping the ante, and you'll also have to keep pulling the rug out from underneath your readers. You have to keep coming up with more and more contorted gimmicks to avoid the, the, the results of the verisimilitude that you are creating. You have to come up with bigger and bigger gimmicks as a result of that. People, the whole world, has to forget things over and over again. They have to forget things that, as a community, they would have experienced. Uh, and so on and so forth. You put those two things together. They seemed harmless at first in the early days of Marvel Comics, but once a, another generation of writers took over, once characters started appearing willy-nilly in each other's books, once readers started to have to remember what had happened, because that's another burden of continuity, is that every every reader, as Stan Lee always used to say, every issue of, Mar of a Marvel comic is somebody's first issue of a Marvel comic. It should be comprehensible to them. But by the rules that he himself created, it could not stay that way. I, because things would change. Because someone would pick up a new issue of, for instance, Iron Man, and say, well, what does he mean? Why does he have roller skates? Or why doesn't his armor look the same as that old issue that my older brother has? What's the story there? Are they the same character? Etc., uh, etc. Et because things have changed, and you had to pay attention. Whereas, if you picked up a Superman comic book in 1959... It would be functionally indifferent, functionally the same as the Superman comic from 1949, or even 1939. Not so in Marvel Comics. In Marvel Comics, things change, and once the Stan Lee virus took hold in the comic book industry, it jumped the blood-brain barrier and affected DC Comics as well. Uh, and in this storyline, we get an apogee of that, uh, of the Stan Lee virus. Uh, Stan Lee wasn't involved with this. He, I, he read it. I have heard apocryphal reports on, on both sides of the spectrum from people who attended comic book conventions and naturally asked the loaded question. I've heard some people say that in private he said he hated the story, and other people in private say, say that in private he said he loved it. Who knows? Knowing that it's Stan Lee, he probably said both with equal amounts of convincing enthusiasm. But this story involves a Marvel character, a lame-ass Marvel character named Iron Man who will be familiar to all of you, not because of the dumb, lame-ass comics, but because of the great movies, because of Robert Downey Jr.'s great portrayal of this character on the big screen. If the Iron Man in the comic books had been even a fraction as interesting as even five minutes of Robert Downey Jr.'s portrayal of the character, I might not be calling him quite so lame-ass. But for the longest time, he had about as much personality as a transistor radio. And he, he was Tony Stark. You will all know the origin story because you've all watched the movie. He's mortally wounded, uh, fighting our enemies in Vietnam, but not in the movies. Uh, he has a piece of shrapnel right next to his heart. He needs to be artificially kept alive. And if it, that artificial life support stops for too long, that thing will kill him. So he invents a breastplate to, to, uh, of his own invention, even though he doesn't have any qualifications along those lines. not a doctor. He invents... A breastplate and then exfoliates that into a, a superpowered armor, a set of armor. It has jets in its boots so he can fly. It has energy weapons in, its, in the palms of the hands so that he can blast energy rays. It enhances his speed and his strength. It's, of course, very tough and durable. It's bulletproof, a ray beam proof to a certain extent. And because Tony Stark is a technologist, he's continually improving his armor. So he still, for the longest time, he still needs the the breastplate in order to keep from dying, all of Stan, almost all of Stan Lee's characters have a built-in weakness of some kind or other. And that was Tony Stark's. That was Iron Man's. But it, he still has that. But he is increasing his, his capabilities. His suit is becoming much stronger, far more form-fitting, far more mobile, uh, far more capable in every way. And uh, over the years, Iron Man drew some pretty good talent. Uh, in terms of artwork, of course, which is pretty much the only reason I ever read Marvel Comics was for the artwork. Gene Colan drew this character for a long time. He's really good. Don Heck is a favorite of mine. He's not a favorite of everybody's, but he's a favorite of mine. He did he did some really good work uh, on, on Iron Man. And uh, 
Johnny Romita, John Romita Jr. did fantastic work on Iron. The artwork in these issues is incredible. It's as vibrant now as it was 40 years ago. Uh, but the issues <laughs> in this storyline, uh, there's a bad guy, just a nondescript bad guy. He's just a, he's a tech competitor to Tony Stark. His name is I had Arm and Hammer Baking Soda, Justin Hammer, Justy Hammer, whatever his name is. Just an ordinary guy who decides, well, I, I want to get at Iron Man, so I'll make his armor malfunction. I'll, I have a team of scientists. They all just punch a time clock. They're not villains. They're all just they all just punch a time clock. So, you know, I, I live on a, on a floating fortress, but nevertheless, they get to go home. They get to see their families. They get you know I I pay them, and I'm just going to tell them, hey, I want you to work on, uh, on all the things that we talked about. Uh, an air conditioning unit that self regulates and turns itself off when people aren't in the room. That sort of thing. But also, I want you to hack Iron Man's armor. And he just gives them this job. He doesn't have any technical knowledge on his own. He just gives his scientists this job. And they do it. <laughs> they manage to do it. That is one prong of this story. And the other prong of this story is the ordinary human weakness of Tony Stark himself, who's feeling the pressure of being Iron Man and the stress of his everyday heroing life, and it drives him to drink. It drives him to abuse alcohol, the demon in the bottle. And his friends are noticing this, his employees are noticing this, but they're not saying anything. They think it's just temporary. He's exercising some demons, he's working out some stress, but he's Iron Man after all, so he's a hero. But not in the Marvel world. Not in the Marvel world with the Stan Lee virus in full effect. No, not at all. Uh, no, nobody's a hero in the Marvel world. They've all got their, what was the term we all used? Oh, we didn't use it. I didn't use it. I hated the long-haired we weirdos that used it. The term was hang-ups. We've all got our hang-ups, man. Uh, those are those are two prongs, and you can see why the one would make the other worse. Tony Stark starts to realize that his Iron Man armor is malfunctioning, and that he doesn't know the reason why. And it's the Iron Man armor. Let's let's underscore here is immensely powerful. It, he can lift a gigantic aircraft carrier, a cruise ship, out of the water. He can use his energy weapons to blast buildings into rubble. It's immensely powerful stuff. So it's not a small thing that it's starting to malfunction, and. It's starting to make him more and more, it's starting to drive him more and more uh, to drink. Uh, and eventually those two things come to a crescendo. And the crescendo is in, I will show you one panel that is the apotheosis of the Stan Lee virus. The apotheosis of why the Stan Lee virus is not workable. It doesn't work. I know you that you Marvel zombies, I mean you Marvel fans, will say that it's given you great stories, and you'll link, you'll definitely rank this as one of them. Marvel fans love this storyline. Uh, you'll say that it's given great stories, and I don't deny that, but it isn't workable. Because in the real world, which you would think you would need verisimilitude for, there aren't any superheroes. Uh, so it, it, every, every, if you imagine that world, if you engage in what science fiction writers refer to as world building, then half these stories go out the window. And the the death knell, Marvel comic writers are constantly coming up with cul-de-sacs that they can't get out of. They can write themselves into it, but they can't write themselves out of it. The biggest of those probably is a storyline called Civil War, where the governments of the world, especially the United States government, decides that it's not going to have superheroes anymore. No one governs them. They aren't attributable to any law. No one knows who their real identities are, and they have huge amounts of power. So no, you have to register with the government and follow the government's orders to do this in the same way that if you take a, a whim into your head to operate a crane at the construction site, you have to be registered to do that. You have to be qualified to do it. Otherwise, you could be really dangerous to everybody around you. The government in Civil War decides to do that and tells the superhero community, do it, or the, the superheroes who comply will hunt the ones who don't comply down, and they'll go to jail. A compelling story, definitely. You've probably seen the movie version of it. But there's no end to that story. There's no way you go back to the status quo if you have that story. And Marvel knew that it had to. You can't go on that way forever. But you would go on that way forever. If that was a story, that would never be reversed. So, you know, you get your dopamine hit. You get your great Stanley virus moment. But where do you go from there? 
Same thing is true in this story. Iron Man's armor is malfunctioning. It's dropping him out of the sky. He doesn't understand it, but he keeps using the armor. Maybe because his judgment is eroded by the fact that he is more and more leaning on alcohol. <laughs> uh, again, this is not a, a seated lawnmower that we're talking about. This is an immensely powerful device that this character is putting himself inside. If he does that, knowing that not only is it malfunctioning, but essentially he's malfunctioning, is he a hero anymore? Do you want to read about him anymore? I don't. Uh, I didn't to begin with, but I don't. I don't anymore then. The thing, I mean, even if you are not in control of your alcohol, your incipient alcoholism, you don't. This is a hundred times worse than getting behind the wheel of a car. And Tony Stark does this repeatedly in this storyline and doesn't take sufficient precautions against a problem he does not, he admits he does not understand. And there's a result. And it's a single panel that should have been the pa a panel, the climax panel in the very last issue of Iron Man, or the second to last issue of Iron Man that's ever occurred. And this was a long time ago. There have been hundreds and hundreds of issues since then. So it obviously wasn't. Iron Man is, gets an invitation, a mysterious invitation, you know, gee, what could, what could go wrong? Uh, to, to be at a photo op with the envoy of another country, the envoy of a foreign country, and there are a million flashbulbs going off. You'll have to Google what the flashbulb is, but there are a million flashbulbs going off, and it all looks fine. Iron Man is a, a famous character. He is the famous industrialist Tony Stark's bodyguard. No one knows they're the same person. He's also an Avenger, one of the founding Avengers. He's a hero. So he's a big celebrity. He's there. The whole crowd's going wild. The envoy is as happy as could be. Iron Man is standing right next to him up on the stage. He puts his hand behind the envoy, on the envoy's back, you know, to show we're, we're on the same team here. And his armor blasts a foot-wide hole through the chest of that envoy, killing him instantly. His, the rays from his gauntleted hand do that. Uh, Tony Stark, who's inside the armor and is, I think, at this moment sober, of course did not intend that. Of course, he's not a killer. He, someone else made his armor do that. In full view of 200 people and 100 cameras. So there's all kinds of film footage of this, all kinds of photos of this. This goes all over the wires immediately. It doesn't, in this issue, Michelini doesn't seem to pay any attention to the fact that he's just shown us a crowd full of reporters, but it would. In the, in the real world, the, the world full of your precious verisimilitude, it would. It would be the only story in the world that Iron Man cold-bloodedly murdered uh, an ambassador. Uh, the police... Of course, they, they're all standing around. They see that this character has just killed someone, but they can't take him into custody. He can lift a battleship in the air. He's bulletproof. They know they can't take him into custody. And so he leaves. And in the storyline, he eventually, uh, he is ordered, you know, uh, hand over your armor. Oh, uh, he swears he's innocent. I didn't do it. Someone hacked my armor. Uh, that isn't how the law would work. You don't get to make up your own... <laughs> you don't get to make law enforcement agree to your alibi of choice. It, law enforcement works on what is visible in the moment. And what is visible in the moment is that Iron Man killed somebody. Now, Iron Man, to them, is Tony Stark's bodyguard. Does this envoy represent a government that has any kind of defense contracts that may be competing with Stark International? With Stark Industries? Is there a legal case that could be made in the real-world Marvel Universe that Tony Stark told his bodyguard to kill this guy? We don't know. We don't go into any details. It seems to me incredibly likely that you could make a case for that. But it doesn't matter anyway. It doesn't matter anyway. Iron Man cold-bloodedly kills someone in full view of the United Press Corps. He doesn't turn himself in, and no attempt is made to arrest him because the police on the scene couldn't. And... He goes on from there. He's dumbfounded about what made his armor blow that big hole in that guy's chest. He'll get to it eventually. Does he go to the funeral? Uh, does he care? Does he ever remember that he, that he, that he killed someone? Uh, it, the story becomes an obsessive hunt for what is making his armor malfunction. Uh, for all the world, as if there isn't a dead body on the stage. And... In the world that is infected by the Stan Lee virus, in the world that has both continuity, a shared continuity, and also verisimilitude, what happens next would not be up for question. It would be as simple as one plus one. 
the local police couldn't do anything about Iron Man, but the government certainly would. Iron Man could fly to the Pentagon. He could fly to the White House and blast it to rubble. And the government knows that. Now they know he's rogue. Now they know he's killed someone. So what the government would do would be, the very first thing the government would do would be to uh, get superpowered help to arrest Iron Man, to find him and bring him in against his will overpower him and bring him into custody. Now, S.H.I.E.L.D., hailed by Nick Fury, uh, who, if you only know the movies, you're going to think Samuel Jackson, but in the in the comics, Nick Fury is uh, a white man, a veteran of World War II. And uh, the government might call S.H.I.E.L.D. S.H.I.E.L.D. is ordinary people with extraordinary weapons, uh, extraordinary technology, and uh, a large amount of personnel. So although it's, it's not a point that's often made at this particular time in Marvel Comics history, S.H.I.E.L.D. would be able to run herd on almost any superhero. They know where you live. They put 10 agents on your house, uh, 10 agents on your gym, uh, sleeping guns, uh, life mortal decoys, ray guns, containment fields. There's almost no superhero, that, and it would be round the clock, so there's almost no superhero that would be able to resist if S.H.I.E.L.D. wanted to bring them in. But it's still ordinary people doing that. So you might think, all right, well, the government might not do that. So they'll get a superhero team to deal with Iron Man. And it won't be the Avengers, because the Avengers might be compromised. Iron Man is a founding member and a member in good standing at the point in this story takes place. I think he's the leader of the Avengers. So the government might not ask the Avengers to police their own house. They might think uh, this is compromised, no matter what works. They might, they might as easily get him out of the country as bring him in. So what will the government do? Well, there's another superhero team in the Marvel Universe that has been cheek to jowl with the U.S. government from the beginning, from the very first issue that Stan Lee wrote. All sorts of government contracts, uh, generals calling on the phone night and day, barking orders and also taking orders, an extremely symbiotic relationship. The government would, of course, call the Fantastic Four, who are headquartered in the Baxter Building a couple of blocks from Avengers Mansion. They would call the Fantastic Four. Let's do a rundown, shall we? <laughs> the youngest member of the Fantastic Four, Johnny Storm, is the Human Torch. Iron Man's armor cannot withstand the highest levels of Johnny Storm's heat intensity, what he calls his Nova level intensity. Iron Man's armor cannot withstand that heat. Strong as it is, it can't do that. That's a, that's a member of the Fantastic Four who can fly just like Iron Man can, as, can strike from a distance just like Iron Man can, and can incapacitate Iron Man's armor. The, in, the upper limits of the strength and energy projection ability of Iron Man's armor is not sufficient to penetrate the force fields of the Invisible Woman, Susan Storm, Susan, Susan Richards. Her, her invisible force fields can contain Iron Man. Not to mention the fact that her invisible force fields can be inserted through his eye slits and blast his armor off his skin from the inside, or any other thing that Sue Richards wants to do. She could contain his jets just globules of force fields on his the bottoms of both his boots so that he can neither walk nor fly. Uh, the Thing, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing, Benjamin J. Grimm, the idol o millions, is stronger than Iron Man. He's more durable than Iron Man, just himself, on his own, just the way he is. He doesn't need armor for it. He's more powerful than Iron Man. And then there's Reed Richards, uh, who is thought up the most advanced, most cutting-edge, most futuristic technological advancements that Tony Stark has ever imagined. Only Reed Richards thought them up when he was 10 and abandoned them because they bored him. Reed Richards understands Tony Stark, who would, if he had the schematics, understand Tony Stark's armor far better than Tony Stark does. Far better and far faster. Even without those schematics, Reed Richards could, in about 10 minutes, come up with a device that would override Iron Man's armor wherever it is and bring it to the Baxter building, whether it's got a person inside it at the moment or whether it's in some dorky suitcase. That armor would just fly up uptown a couple of blocks to the Baxter building and enter into a secured forensic force field for the government to take, uh, to you know, to do whatever it wants. The government would go to the Fantastic Four. Those are four members of the team. You put them all together, Iron Man would last about five seconds. And that's what would happen. Unless you're coming up with some weird loophole, which is what you have to do. 
you you have a writer who wants to pursue verisimilitude he's going to violate continuity you want you have a writer who wants to pursue continuity he's going to violate verisimilitude you want a writer who thinks wouldn't it be cool if a villain shot aunt may and she is on the, the brink of death well, yeah that would be cool but where do you go from there well we can have peter parker make a deal that the whole world forgets something about his personal life and then we have his personal life that's different <laughs> we have this deal and every writer has to remember that uh, that's what would happen if Iron Man, as he does, cold-bloodedly killed someone in front of the, the world's press corps, the Fantastic Four would bring him in. That same day. Wouldn't be any of this, well, you know, I, I'm as confused as you are, I will definitely hand over some parts of my armor and maybe some schematics. No. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be that at all. It would be, you're under arrest. And we don't want to risk ordinary pension-drawing shield agents, so we're going to tell the Fantastic Four to bring you in, and they're easily going to be able to do it. Any one member could do that, but Reed Richards could certainly just invalidate the whole thing. Uh, instead, that doesn't happen. Instead, Tony Stark is just putting on his armor, and sometimes later on in the story, putting on his armor while drunk. Eventually working his way to get to the end of, to get to the bottom of what's going on, what's making his armor malfunction. Again, I want to point out the dead body, <laughs> which no one mentions again. Uh, eventually it leads him to Arm and Hammer's you know, baking soda factories to his, to his his floating fortress, and a sequence in which this guy, this ordinary guy, this business competitor of Tony Stark, has assembled a whole bunch of Iron Man's villains, his super villains. Uh, and he has them all fight Iron Man in a climactic moment that I admit is extremely well done, mainly due to uh, John Romita Jr.'s pencils, and Bob Layton does a really good job with the renderings. He Bob Layton did a lot of story spitballing with Michelini as well on the on the, the story, but he he he's a wonderful companion to the early John Romita Jr. artwork. Uh, really wonderful at making this a finished product. He was the indispensable man in this product, and there is a sequence at the end of this where Iron Man, Tony Stark, you know, always darkest before the dawn, that sort of thing, dons his armor and fights all of these villains, and it is epic. I bought that issue, and I was, I never usually buy Iron Man, because he's a guy in armor. Who, who cares? That's it. That's the elevator pitch. He's a guy in armor. What's that you say? He's a guy that turns green when he's really angry. What's that you say? He's a guy who gets really small, ant size. Okay, great. Uh, you got any more for me? Uh, okay, he's a guy who can run really fast. Okay, he's a guy who has a magic ring. <laughs> now, I want, I want a, the sole survivor of an entire culture. I want uh, an exiled Norse god. I want something with a story behind it. I just want a gimmick. You put somebody in in Iron Man's suit of armor, and that person can fly and blast repeller, repulsor rays and whatnot. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, the story just sort of limps on, and the drama is the, a very famous panel sequence. I wish I'd copied it out for you uh, of of one of Tony Stark's ubiquitous lady friends getting him through delirium tremens and getting him on the right path to to sobriety uh and it's so it's, it's a very despite that that big set piece fight at the end it's a very human triumph at the end of the story that tony stark feels like he has control of his life again those of you who deal with actual alcoholism will know that those victories are never permanent there's always a, a fine line you're walking and there are stressors there are all sorts of factors that can that can give you a really bad month, a really bad year, and you have to build from nothing. And that is a valorous story, but it's not a valorous story if the whole time you're doing that, you are occasionally putting on gold and yellow armor that is capable of raising a city block, whether you're sane, whether you're sober or drunk. That's not the same thing. It's totally unrealistic. Just and. and and the way it's wrapped up with a neat little bow is exactly what write, Marvel writers have to well, any It's not Marvel anymore. It's anybody, any Stan Lee virus writer has to do this. They can't live with the long-term implications of their own fixations, of the, the own features of the Stan Lee virus. That panel that I showed you would be the end of Iron Man as a superhero. What are you supposed to do once you get Arm & Hammer baking soda back into control when you put him in jail? Well, then what happens? You put out a press release to all of the millions and millions of people who saw this very image? You put out a press release to all of them and say, I wasn't in control of my armor, see? But I am now, 
<laughs> oh, and by the way, I was drunk a lot of the time, but I'm not anymore. <laughs> no, that isn't how it would work. Even if the Fantastic Four weren't told to bring this guy in and throw him into the darkest pit of the deepest jail, there would still be no more Iron Man, the Golden Avenger. That would absolutely not happen. This panel would end it. Because the only press release you can say about this is, I wasn't in control of my armor. What's anyone going to think after that? Are you in control of your armor now? Can you guarantee you'll be in control of your armor tomorrow? If my little girl is in her elementary school with 50 other students and there's a gunman who's holding them hostage, do I want you to show up on the scene? Or would I rather take their chances with the gunman? <laughs> Not to mention the fact that the minute... That is the only alibi. That's the only thing you can say here. It's obviously Iron Man. And the person is not dead. For all I know, maybe this on in some in some later comic, maybe this envoy was retroed as alive. But in the storyline, he's good and properly dead, murdered. So the only the only alibi, the only the only story that you can come up with here is that the armor was hijacked. Well, there's never going to be peace or contentment after that. Could the Mad Thinker? Hijack if if an ordinary guy, an ordinary tech bro with his ordinary you know gumshoe workers in the lab can do this, then could the Mad Thinker do it? Yes. Could the Wingless Wizard do it? Yes. Could Reed Richards do it when someone is in control of his mind? Yes, absolutely. Could Professor X control Tony Stark's mind and do this? Yes. Yes, he absolutely could. There are a whole bunch of people who could do this. Not to mention Doctor Effing Doom. <laughs> This is a wide open thing, and the story doesn't close it at all. It's just the the writer, the writers, in the grip of the Stanley virus, thought this would be really cool. We'll give him two things: the public completely loses confidence in Iron Man because it sees his armor kill somebody, and we as readers completely lose confidence in Tony Stark because we see him descend into girlfriend abusing alcoholism. Well, okay. That's a terrific story, and I might be willing grudgingly to admit that Demon in a Bottle is a, a, a convincing story, a really, it parts, compelling story, provided it's the last Iron Man story. But it wasn't. <laughs> it isn't the last Iron Man story. So, I, whether it's this or Civil War, where the, the government tells superheroes you have to register, you get a pension, but you have to do what we say, the government would never rescind that. Or... To use a more recent example, the X-Men becoming racial supremacists and sequestering themselves on an offshore island and threatening the world uh, with blackmail and also apocalypse. In the Stan Lee world, that's always going to have been true. So even when, if the X-Men, for instance, badly needed, I don't think it'll ever happen, but if the X-Men, some sane writer were to come along and were told, I don't know what this guy did to this franchise, but I want you to, no, no pun intended, pull it up by its roots, eradicate all of it, and bring this back to being a superhero team of mutants who are, who are dedicated to fighting for a world that hates and fears them. I want that back, and I want it back in two issues. You have two issues to just get rid of all of this stuff. If a writer were to come along and do that, well, according to the Stan Lee virus, all that still happened. All the, the world will still remember that the X-Men started or acted for years like they were the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, like they were Magneto. Unless you have them communally forget, unless you make them forget it all, in which case, well, anyway, you have to pull the rug out in order to have it happen, as opposed to not doing any of this. And as opposed to not doing any of this. That, that maybe Iron Man is a hero. And that maybe the point of having a hero is that you look up to them. And that maybe the reason you look up to them is because they don't share your feet of clay. They are aspirational. <sighs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway that, is, that is Iron Man, Demon in a Bottle. Which I halfway suspect Mike picked just to get me to rant about the Stanley Virus. Because <laughs> that's what this is. This, this is what you get. This kind of story is what you get if you subscribe to the Stanley Virus. Well, Iron Man is just a superhero. Someone could hack his armor and he could kill someone. And also, Tony Stark is just a man. So, yes, you've been looking up to him for all these issues in Iron Man and the Avengers, but he could easily become a jerk and descend into alcoholism. And with no guarantee that he ever that he ever permanently gets out of it again. <laughs> Those can look great. Those stories look great on paper. But they don't work at all in a superhero comic. 
yeah, I mean, I know they look on the surface like they do work because the Stanley virus is it rules the roost now. No one writes the kind of comics that the Stanley virus supplants. No one writes those kind of comics anymore. Uh, but <laughs> this is why I rail against it because this doesn't make any sense. And if you had told me 50 years ago, well, this comic doesn't make any sense, I'd have said, okay, well, it doesn't need to make sense. Of course, it doesn't make sense. It's Wonder Woman. You know, fighting Egg Fu Young or whatever. It's, it's one woman fighting Am uh, evil Amazons. It doesn't need to make sense. But if you're going to tell me, no, no, we want it to have verisimilitude and continuity, in-world continuity, we want it to make sense, well, this it's not going to work, and this is what you get. Uh, so there you go. A Marvel classic for you on Epic Comic Book Wednesday. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Anyway, we'll see what Mike has in store next week. He could go one of two ways, right? Uh, two paths are diverging in front of him. One to the Jedi Temple and one to the Sith Order. <laughs> he could either uh, take us back to, to wonderful stuff, or he could go even further down the line uh, of contention. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see what happens. I will join you all next Wednesday, and we'll see. <laughs> Until then, I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.